Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live broadcast with MedStar Health. My name is Sarah Reidenauer, and today I'm joined by Dr. Christina Ensman, a gynecologist and menopause specialist with MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital, Dr. Morale Mal Malikzadeh, a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon, and Rebecca Schwender, a physical therapist and pelvic floor specialist with MedStar Health Physical Therapy. We're proud to partner with Red Hot Mamas, the leading nonprofit provider of menopause education and support programs in the US and Canada. Our experts today will define menopause as well as the symptoms, causes, and treatments, uh, treatment options for various types of pain in your lower abdomen. You'll walk away with some tips to manage menopause and when you see your gynecologist for more painful symptoms. We'll also meet a physical therapist who specializes in pelvic floor disorders and can help with exercises and techniques to help reduce pain and discomfort. So if you're approaching or living with menopause and have pain that is impacting your quality of life, of life, you're in the right place. And if you have any questions or comments for our experts, you can ask them in the comments below. So let's meet today's guest. Uh, Dr. Christina Ensman is a board certified gynecologist with expertise in menopausal medicine, endometriosis, fibroid management, and minimally invasive surgery. She went to medical school and completed her residency at the University of Hamburg in Germany, as well as an additional residency at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore. She wants to empower women to conquer their menopausal transition as a positive mi health milestone and help them enjoy their midlife to the fullest. Welcome, Dr. Ensman. Thank you for being here today. Um, next, we have Dr. Morale Malgzade a fellowship trained minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon who specializes in abnormal uterine bleeding, endometrios endometriosis, menstrual irregularities, ovarian cysts, and more. She earned, um, she earned doctor of, sorry, she earned doctor of osteopathic medicine degree at Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine in New York, completed her residency at Michigan State University Sparrow Hospital, and her fellowship at Cleveland Clinic in Florida. Welcome, Dr. Melizade. Thank you for being here. And also we have Rebecca Schwender. Uh, she holds a doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Delaware. She has practiced as an orthopedic physical therapist for 10 years and has been treating women's pelvic health conditions for almost two years. She's currently working towards earning um, the Certificate of Achievement from the Academy of Pelvic Health Physical Therapy and her areas of clinical interest include pregnancy and postpartum return to physical activity. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for being here. Um, so let's get started with our questions. Um, Dr. Ensman, first of all, we often hear the terms perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. What are the differences between those conditions? Yes, hello. Yeah, I love it. I feel you ask me this question every time. So, but it's important. So menopause per definition is actually that last menstrual period, which we only know like after 12 months, not having had a cycle that this was actually menopause. So you can say, for example, my last menstrual period, oh, no, sorry, my menopause was April 2018, something like that. That's the correct term. However, so we use it in many other ways. So everything that comes after that last menstrual um, cycle is actually postmenopause, correctly termed. So we have to say we are actually all postmenopausal women. However, that's cumbersome, so we stick with the menopausal term. And now the perimenopause is the time around that last menstrual period, which starts with many years often before that last menstrual period, usually when we get the first cycle irregularities, which are a sign of ovarian aging. And then this perimenopause includes that one last year after the last menstrual period, which is again the menopause. Um, the perimenopause is important because that's often the time when women are the most symptomatic, actually. That doesn't mean they don't have symptoms later on, um, but that's really what women remember the most is the perimenopause. Okay, and then speaking of symptoms, could you go over um, some of those symptoms? Yes, very typical symptoms that everyone always reads about, and that's actually true, are the hot flashes. Okay. They are the hot flashes, the brain fog, 
sleep problems. Um, it, however, it can also be things we don't talk so much about is actually joint pains, palpitations. So these can all be part of that perimenopausal transition and the early menopausal years. Some women will have some of the vasomotor symptoms, particularly for a very long time. And later on, as our tissues are deprived of estrogen for a longer, a longer time, we see more symptoms that we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause. That's the new term. And it basically describes that there are tissue changes in the bladder, which causes often urinary frequency um, and can also cause discomfort in the vagina with vaginal dryness or pain. And then what are some of the treatment options for those symptoms? So question is now, so first of all, yes, there are many treatment options and it always depends what symptoms are we talking about. Right. So in the conventional medical realm, so for the hot flash, so no, let me roll back. First of all, <laughs> I want to say menopausal transition and menopause and the postmenopause is not a disease. So first of all, so it's not like everyone needs treatment. That's not the case. If someone has noticed they have hot flashes, but otherwise they are functioning well, there's nothing you have to do about it. That's the first thing I want to say. Okay. However, if, if a woman has symptomatic, is, is really suffering from her symptoms and she can't function. Let's say she has tremendous hot flashes at night and can't get restful sleep and can't function the next day, or her hot flashes are so severe that she has to stop whatever she's doing at work, or she has tremendous brain fog and can't really focus and it affects her work performance or family life performance, whatever it is, then she should ask her physician for help. So, Having said this, most um, uh, effective treatment still for hot flashes uh, is hormone replacement therapy. If you are early in menopause or you just started or within 10 years and you have no contraindications to hormone replacement therapy, which would be, for example, a personal history of breast cancer or um, uncontrolled hypertension, if you don't have any of these, you might be a good candidate. However, if someone doesn't want to take hormones, there are many um, prescription medications, good amount, let's say it like this. I don't want to exaggerate, but there are a good number of possibilities that are not as good as the hormones, but pretty good. Okay, so ask your physician for it. And then, um, however, also worthwhile mentioning is lifestyle changes. We have pretty good data now. And a change in diet, so really cutting out all sugar and have a very green vegetable-based diet, which doesn't mean you can't have meat, it just means increase your greens and veggies, can actually be tremendously helpful for, for mild to moderate uh, menopausal symptoms. Great. That's great to know. Thank you for explaining all of that for us. Um, Dr. Melgzade, can you tell us, um, explain the pelvic floor a little bit? First of all, where is it um, exactly? Sure. I'm going to hold up a photo over here. Okay. You look at this photo, you'll see your hip bones kind of up here. Down here is your tailbone, your coccyx, and in between you have all these muscles. And these muscles surround um, the opening of the urethra up here, the vaginal opening, and your anus. So you have this group of muscles. This is what we refer to as the pelvic floor. And then, of course, overlying the pelvic floor, you have your organs. So your uterus, your ovaries, your bowels, bladder, all of that is kind of sitting on top of all this uh, musculature that we have. Okay, thank you. And so what could cause um, pelvic or abdominal pain? Yeah, um, so really when I see a patient that comes in with pelvic pain, the first thing to assess is whether this is something acute, just happened recently, or has it been long-standing chronic? So if it's been more than six months uh, or so, to so define as chronic pelvic pain. Um, acute pain is typically something more inflammatory, infectious, traumatic. Um, it's just pain that doesn't go away and is persistent. Whereas chronic pain kind of comes and goes, doesn't have to be persistent, but you always notice it there. Okay. And then from there, I take it into about three paths that I think of. One is your visceral organ. So what I mean by that, your GYN organs, um, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal issues, urological issues, um, the second path is more muscle related. Um, and then the third, uh, is there a psychosocial component to all of this? So 
Um, in terms of GYN organs, so I think, do they have a big uterus? Do they have fibroids? Do they have ovarian or pelvic masses? Do they have a history of endometriosis or a history of uh, infections, ruptured appendix? What is their surgical history? Do they have a lot of scar tissue potentially? Um, and then with gastrointestinal, I think, okay, does this patient have IBS or inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulitis? Uh, when was their last colonoscopy? Um, urological, you know, do they have recurrent urinary tract infections, history of kidney stones? Um, so that's kind of more of the organ related pain that's part of the process. Um, then I think about the muscles. So the pelvic floor muscles that I showed you, do they have a history of fibromyalgia? Are they diabetic? Can it be a neuropathic pain? Um, so that's when the physical exam becomes really important because we evaluate the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and then psychosocial. So a big component can also be um, anxiety, depression, abuse, panic disorders, what's going on kind of in their personal life with their partners. Um, and sometimes it's a combination really of multiple things. Um, so this is where a very uh, detailed history, a physical exam, and sometimes we may need uh, more support things like uh, imaging, so a pelvic ultrasound, maybe a CT scan, an MRI, um, to kind of put everything together. Okay. And so then for treatment options, um, what are the different treatment options for, you know, the different situations and um, when, if at all, would surgery be necessary? Sure. Um, so the biggest thing is to identify the cause of the pelvic pain, because that really is what determines your treatment options. So if it's related to menopause, you know, Dr. Enzen spoke about uh, hormone therapy versus non-hormone therapy, uh, if, if we're thinking the pain is related to that. Um, if it's more of a structural issue, like let's say you have a large fibroid uteri, pelvic masses, um, you know, something that imaging and maybe a physical exam will help uh, kind of pinpoint, then you may need surgery to remove uh, kind of these unusual structures that may have become larger or can be pressing on other organs causing pain. Um, if it's more of a muscle related issue, then um, there are options like pelvic floor physical therapy, there's vaginal dilators, um, we have trigger point injections, uh, which essentially means injecting steroids or an anesthetic into a group of muscles that I showed you to help relieve some of that pain. Um, and if it's more of a psychosocial nature to the pain, then that's when you'll need a more multimodal approach with behavioral therapy. Maybe you see a pain specialist, a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, so there's different routes to go. And what it really comes down to is what is the source of the pain? Right. All right. Thank you for explaining that. Um, before we get into more questions, I'm going to pause for a minute. And if you're just now joining us, welcome. My name is Sarah Reidenauer, and I am joined today by Dr. Christina Ensman, a gynecologist and menopause specialist with MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital, Dr. Morale Malgzade, a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon, and Rebecca Schwunder, a physical therapist and pelvic floor specialist with MedStar Health Physical Therapy. Um, we're proud to partner with Red Hot Mamas, the leading nonprofit provider of menopause education and support programs in the US and Canada. Today, our experts are defining menopause as well as the symptoms, causes, and treatment options for various types of pain in your lower abdomen. So stick around to learn more. Give us a like to let us know you're watching. Share this broadcast with your friends. And if you have any questions for our experts, you can ask those in the comments below. Um, Dr. Ensman, if pain is chronic and surgery is not needed, how would you address the care, um, the cycle of physical and emotional concerns um, that pelvic pain can cause? Yeah, that, that's a complex question because it of course depends what was actually now the reason for that, that person's pain, like Dr. Malak said, I, you know, really delineated. So however, I think most important is that the patient, um, it's very specific how that pain really affects her, her daily life because then I can understand as a provider what is the area we have to improve to make her feel better? Is it intimacy with her partner? Is it she's not able to do some of her, her activities, her, her sport activities, um, or is it just the daily pain that kind of affects her well being and her mood? So, depending that, um, you know, we would, you know, con go into different treatment options. Um, let's say you said no surgery. So if it's really, let's say, musculoskeletal conditioning, because 
you have to understand. So I tried to explain my patients the following way. It's like you had a motor vehicle accident and you get this whiplash and they give you the thing around the neck and you wear it for 30 days and then they take it off and they say, you're fine now. And you're like, but excuse me, my neck is still hurting. And the same thing actually happens in the pelvic floor. So whatever the initiating event is, is it surgery? Is it a long standing endometriosis? These pain vicious cycles, they do remain often. And even if the patient had surgery in the past, that pain often continues. So now we have to recondition, so to speak, um, the pelvic floor or these muscle fibers. And that's where actually pelvic floor physical therapy can be extremely helpful because someone like um, Rebecca, they really can teach these women to relax these muscles again. And um, you know, many women then say, oh, you know, I know Kegel exercise. I, I do this all the time. And I'm like, no, what you have to learn is all the opposite. You, because you already have a very tight pelvic floor, you might actually need to learn how to relax that. And that's where I love that we have providers like Rebecca, because this is some a very fantastic and powerful knowledge. Right. So speaking of Rebecca, well, I have a question, some questions for you. Um, so how is pelvic floor disorders, um, physical therapists, how are they different from, you know, seeing general PTs? So by the nature of pelvic floor conditions, the treatment options and examination will occur in a more private setting uh, versus orthopedic physical therapy is often performed kind of in an open gym setting. Um, concerns that patients are bringing to me, uh, they often need a little bit more privacy to share that information with me so that I can fully examine and understand what it is that's going on. So that's one difference. Uh, physical therapists that are specialized in pelvic floor physical therapy have undergone additional training and education to understand not only the anatomy and neuromuscular system of the body, but to understand how that relates specifically to pelvic floor and women's health conditions. Even though there are some differences, there's a lot of over lap as well between a general physical therapist as well as a pelvic floor physical therapist. For example, I'm still going to be recommending interventions that could include exercises that might involve strengthening or exercises that might involve stretching. I'll also include modalities as part of my treatment and examples of different modalities could be heat or cold to help with pain management. Um, there's a type of treatment called electrical stimulation that can help both the patient and the um, therapist understand when muscles are overactive or when muscles are underactive and kind of helping the patient to understand the difference and learn how to control those muscles as Dr. Ensman was sharing. If we need to make those muscles more active we can, or if we need to kind of downregulate and have those muscles be less active, we can work on that as well. So that's some of the similarities between physical therapy, regardless of what your um, underlying condition is and what you're coming for. Right, and what are some of the symptoms that your patients show when they come in to see you? So I take a whole person approach to the care of my patients. So while I'll be examining and understanding the pelvic floor, I'm going to look at areas around there too. So as Dr. Malik Zada showed earlier, the pelvic floor, that's a very two-dimensional picture, but our patients are three-dimensional people. So we're looking not just at that two-dimensional approach, we're going to look at how is the whole pelvis and low back functioning. So how is the low back maybe inner... Um, affecting how the pelvic floor functions, how is hip strength or hip posture, how is all of that affecting the pelvic floor as well? Um, so those are some um, symptoms that I'm looking at is not just the pelvic floor, is there back pain, is there hip pain, other things that might be going on in that anatomic region. Other symptoms that patients might present with pain is certainly one of them. And that pain could happen in many different domains. It could be pain with intercourse, possibly during a gynecological exam. And for those women that are still perimenopausal, if they're using tampons, even potentially pain with uh, use of a tampon. Um, but pain isn't the only symptom I see. Um, it could be challenges holding either the bowel or bladder. So maintaining um, continence is a common symptom that I 
we'll see patients um, challenged by. Um, heaviness is also a common symptom. Um, urgency or frequency of needing to urinate are also symptoms that I see. So just know that pain can be part of the picture, but pain isn't the only symptom. So some of these other symptoms that show up are worth discussing with your healthcare provider, especially if they're impacting your quality of life. Right. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, so how do you help, you know, the patients that you see based on what their symptoms are? Do you have them, you know, doing different exercises or how, how do you help um, your, your different patients with their symptoms? Okay. So a lot of it goes to that first exam. So doing the exam and determining what challenges is this individual having with their lifestyle and understanding the impairments that we see in that one individual person. So are there tight muscles that need to be stretched? Then stretching could be part of our program. Are there muscles that are weak? Then strengthening those muscles. Are there muscles that are overactive? then we're teaching those muscles to turn off. So exercise intervention is a big component of the treatment plan, but the exercises are gonna be unique to that individual and the symptoms that they're experiencing. We will also look at things like breathing strategies. So as Dr. Malakzada shared earlier, psychosocial components can be contributing to why someone has pain. Um, and we know working on diaphragmatic breathing can be a way to help reduce pain, reduce anxiety, regulate heart rate, regulate respiratory rate. So there's really lots of benefit to working on breathing. And as the diaphragm moves, it applies pressure on the pelvic floor as well, because um, those two layers of the body, they kind of run parallel to each other. So breathing strategies are a technique that I'm often using with my patients. Um, body mechanics is a big part of physical therapy as well. Um, so as Dr. Ensman shared earlier, activity modification can be a wonderful strategy to help patients. So as your body changes and evolves with your life, just know those changes are different. It doesn't mean you have to give up your life or the quality of your life or the way you choose to live there are ways to maybe modify how you've done activity in the past to make it more comfortable. And so you can continue participating. Right, and so I think you touched on this a little bit, but how important is it that patients with pelvic floor disorders stay active? Well, I would even share it's important for everyone to stay active. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, current guidelines from the Department of Health and Human Services recommend all uh, healthy adults to um, aim for 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week. And that physical activity could be any aerobic activity that you enjoy doing. So it doesn't mean that you have to go out and run or you have to go swimming, pick what you like. If you enjoy rowing, you enjoy walking, riding your bike, there's lots of different aerobic activity there. And the best aerobic activity is gonna be the one that you, you'll do. Um, so if it's something that you enjoy doing, pick the one that you do. Um, now the pelvic floor can certainly play, have an impact on what physical activity is available mm -hmm. to an individual. So for example, if a patient or an individual is having pelvic floor symptoms with running, then running might not be the best activity at that moment in time until further discussion has happened with their gynecologic provider, with a pelvic floor physical therapist, starting with something that provides less load on the pelvic floor, such as walking or riding a bike, might be a better option for that person at that moment in time. And then with treating some symptoms that individual is having, working up to physical activity that you ultimately want to participate in. A uh, way that, our, or analogy that I think of with that would be if you wanted to do strength training at the gym, well, if you can curl 15 pounds using your biceps, you're not gonna pick up 75 pound weights and try and do bicep curls. So right. those muscles of the pelvic floor, they're like muscles elsewhere in our body and we need to apply load to them, but in a safe, progressive way. Got it, thank you. And so once again, this is something you've touched on, but just to reiterate, what can a patient expect um, on their first visit to physical therapy? 
Great question. So certainly having expectations coming into your first appointment can help uh, make that appointment less daunting. Um, so uh, the physical therapist first is going to have a conversation with the patient. So I want to just open that door to understand what's going on. Share with me your story, because uh, I really need to know what, how certain symptoms are affecting an individual's life, because I might see two patients that have the same diagnosis, but that diagnosis can mean very different things to very different people, depending on activities they enjoy doing, uh, where they are in their lives and what they want their quality of life to look like. So it starts with that conversation. And then uh, we move into a physical exam. So the physical exam will include that whole person approach. So looking at someone's posture, looking at structures that surround the pelvic floor. So looking at how the spine moves, are the hips strong? Do the hips have good flexibility? Are there muscles elsewhere other than the pelvic floor that are maybe tight and would benefit from stretching? So looking kind of at that overall person and evaluating that individual. Um, and then it also includes a pelvic floor exam. This can be done both from an external approach or from an internal approach through the vagina. And that is all patient specific. So I have some patients that want to have the full exam. So they have as much information as possible about their body and other patients that maybe want a more conservative approach. And it is completely the patient's choice. And I'm just there to work with them and help them um, better understand their body and, and reach their goals. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, like you said, it can be a little scary going into a you know doctor's appointment of any kind and not really knowing what's going on. So that explanation probably makes it a little more, like you said, a little less daunting for, for people. Um, and my next question, uh, can certain exercises or activities cause lower um, stomach pain? I know, or I know that you mentioned, you know, walking versus running. Um, but is it all kind of, you know, individual based on the patient? Um, what can cause pain? Or is there, you know, certain exercises that kind of can happen, do that for everybody? I wouldn't necessarily say that there are exercises or activities that are automatically going to precipitate pain for everyone. It is very individualized as far as you know, that individual's strength baseline, their flexibility baseline. Um, but as Dr. Malikzadeh had touched on earlier, trauma and injury and uh, past gynecologic surgery can have an impact as well, um, especially kind of on the psychosocial side of an individual's health. Um, so thinking kind of of trauma or um, a past injury, your body kind of can remember that injury. Uh, analogy to that would be like watching a scary movie. You know, you might see something happen in a scary movie and you can kind of feel that in your own body. Well, nothing's actually harming you or hurting you right at that moment, uh, but your body can have memories of that too. If you've had past history of sexual trauma or, or injury, certain things can kind of trigger that and bring that up again. And the body's going to respond kind of with this tightening response um, and kind of that those heightened levels of, of pain. Um, and so that those are things to certainly kind of bring up with your gynecologic provider, your um, physical therapist to, to address that. Right. Thank you. Thank you for answering all those questions. Um, my last question for all of you, um, is what is the message you all would like our viewers to take away after joining us for this broadcast? Um, Dr. Ensman, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I would say, please be persistent um, because you have to understand as physicians, we have like, there are certain steps we go through. So, you know, and we are, if you come, we might start with one thing. And if that's not helping your problem, don't think, oh no, Dr. Ensman couldn't help me. Please come back because we need to see you back so we can step it up and, you know, then refer you. That is really, really, really important. Right. Really be persistent, be very specific where, you know, where is your pain? How does it affect you? 
and um, that way we, we can f slowly figure out what is going to help you. It takes often a while. I often say it's like an onion that has so many layers, particularly when pain has been going on for a long time. So we have to kind of start peeling one layer away after the next until we get to the source of the problem. Right. Thank you. Dr. Melixade, did you have anything? Um, I think similar to Dr. Enzman that sometimes it takes uh, it's a multimodal approach. You may be referred to other consultants to kind of put the story together. And it's not because anyone is shooing anybody away. It's just, you know, trying to really identify the source of the problem is not something that can necessarily happen in, you know, one, one quick visit. It might need a few steps. It might need imaging. It might need seeing a physical therapist. It might take, you know, some treatment options even before really getting to the root of the problem. So, being persistent and patient with yourself and not being so hard on yourself until we figure out the solution. Right, great, thank you. And Rebecca, you have the um, hard task of going last with this. Every time we do this, the wrap up question, everybody's like, what she said, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, certainly I echo what Dr. Enzman and Dr. Malik Zada um, shared. I would also encourage patients just to realize you're not alone um, when you're, going through menopause, it is a life transition. As Dr. Ensman shared earlier, it is not a medical condition. It is a normal life transition. And so there are normal changes that happen to the body. And if you're not sure if something that's changed for you is a normal change, or if it's something that you need to address or are concerned about, but if you've had kind of a change in your quality of life, speak up about it. Um, just because you age doesn't mean you have to hurt. Um, so certainly if you're having new different sensations that you have not had before, bring it up to your provider. You're not alone. Um, as you've seen on this uh, talk today, there are multiple providers out there and we're ready to have a team here to help you. So start the conversation with one of them and then the rest of the team will follow. Right. Well, those are all perfect points to wrap up our broadcast. So I wanna thank our viewers for joining us today and to all our experts for joining us and taking time out of your day to answer our questions. We really appreciate it. Um, you can visit medstarhealth.org to learn more about our women's health specialist and MedStar Health Physical Therapy. Um, to request an appointment, call the women's health specialist at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital at 443-444 five seven one one or visit medstarhealth.org slash ensman or medstarhealth.org slash malgzade for menopause resources visit redhotmamas.org for a physical therapy appointment call medstar health physical therapy at 844-91-GET PT which is 844-914-3878 eight. We'll be posting all of those links and phone numbers in the comments below. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.